today we've got uh, Rick Hogg from Warhog Tactical down. Uh, we've been uh, looking forward to having you down here for a while to do a little team room talk. Thanks for having me on, Clint. I appreciate it. What got you started with Warhog? Why? And um, maybe the second question would be, what's what's the difference between Warhog and others? Um, so really, Warhog, a lot of people think that Warhog was established because I was getting ready to retire. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of understand my history, I was an instructor with uh, Seventh Group at the Advanced Urban Combat Committee. Mm -hmm. It was the guys that came back from Afghanistan in 2002 that told me, hey, man, that stuff you taught me saved my life. Dude, that was the hook setter. Yeah. So that's, and I'd been teaching North Carolina concealed carry beforehand. So Yes, I, I knew I wanted to be in the firearms realm eventually when I got out. But, man, when those guys came back, you know, that was boom. And mm -hmm. and really the beauty was I would say this FIWIC program set me up for a lot of success. Um, you know, Team Sergeant was able to pick who he wanted. Mm -hmm. Hey, run the POI like you want. And really I think for 7th Group where we kind of differentiated ourselves from others, we got done, I believe, the group in 18 months. Mm-hmm now you want to keep this thing going so what do you do we bring in company operations and really that's why i think seventh group got into the hopper into afghanistan so quick after fifth because at that point we realized hey language doesn't matter so you guys have a different kind of skill than others let's launch them in there there's my personal opinion on that mm -hmm. one but really this file program went from the regular combat marksmanship program that you're used to now we had to stop and go all right we got guys that have already been through this poi don't give me it's a great POI, we want to bring them to the next level. So mm -hmm. how do we do that? So that was part of the beauty with the Safari 2 program, for lack of better terms. We broke off. We had, yes, the regular combat marksmanship, but then my team star was like, hey, I think I went to him or he went to me. It doesn't matter. I said, I want to do something different. How do we advance, you know, this program? How do we give these guys better skills? Mm -hmm. So, you know, going through this Safari program, hey, I want to focus on concealed carry. I want to focus on strong support hand. I want to focus on, you know, seated position, put these guys in different positions, work different drills, make it harder for them so their marksmanship can get better. Mm -hmm. They can take that info because, again, it was sprinkled throughout the teams. They can then spread that when they're doing their team training, and it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, wow. So, yeah. Yeah, The the um, I think maybe a lot of the reasons why I think uh, seventh seventh. Charlie 3-7 has been around and probably been the deepest into that uh, that type of shooting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's pretty rich over there with with that particular company and battalion. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it, you know, let's uh, I want to jump back just a little bit. Sure. Um, when when did you come into service? And I, and I know you you served in the 82nd and the, yep. the Airborne for a little while. Yep. What, what what was that like? And then uh, what really spurred you on to make that that jump into into the group? So rewind, I think it's, you got to start prior to. So mm -hmm. around, um, so what I always wanted to go into the military, specifically the Army. I knew I wanted to do Special Forces. So in the 80s, they had, you know, the SF baby program that we know today mm -hmm. was still there. You could sign in from off the street and go into Special Forces training. That's what I originally. Interesting. Yeah, that's what I originally planned to do. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, you kind of know your SF history a little bit. Somewhere around that time, we got the SF branch, I believe it was 87. Mm -hmm. They cut the program at that point, so I could not do the uh, delayed yeah, entry okay. program until I did delayed entry June '88 because mm -hmm. I knew, hey, I'm going as soon as I graduate. Yep, that had gone away, so the only option That's I so had. So strange, I did the exact same thing. '88 yep. delayed entry program. Keep yep. going, sorry. Well, I did I did delayed entry in '87. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously coming in for '88. Yep. Um, so the SF baby program had gone away. The best they could give me, because then I knew, all right, do some more research, try to do Rangers. Nope. Here's the best we can give you. Unassigned airborne, no bonus. Mm -hmm. Okay, I said, cool, we'll jump out of planes. That's fine. We'll go with that. Um, you know, then obviously come down, you know, Fort Benning, do your infantry training, do your airborne. Uh, Rangers were actually trying to recruit at that, or Rangers weren't recruiting for 11 Charlies because I was an 11 Charlie mm -hmm. at that time. So I tried to go over there, said, nope, said, all right, off we go to the 82nd. Um, go up to the 82nd. Um, really probably the big spike thing there was in 90, you know, Desert Storm kicks off. Mm -hmm. My, you know, my battalion didn't go to Panama for whatever reason. I, I could, I can remember they sent us on leave prior to, I was there, I think it was the 19th when things were spinning up, mm -hmm. trying to run down the street. Hey man, what bird can I get on? <laughs> yeah. Who needs a spot? You know, yeah. 
and you know it just didn't work out for that so 90 kicks around you know desert storm um come back from that you know and, and you have these experiences along the way that hey the 80 seconds are great great place to grow up i had mm-hmm. some great squad leaders i probably learned some of my best leadership from those squad leaders because mm-hmm. my first one was like you know leadership 101 he's like when you're looking at these different leaders out there he said you take the good you stick it in this pocket he said take the bad as well put it in this pocket you always draw from the good pocket not from the bad so yeah. that was one of those things that stuck with me so it was good there but it's always going, hey, how do I go to SF? Because yeah. at Bragg, man, at that time, there was three groups there. You had third, fifth, and seventh. So there were plenty of Green Berets floating around that post, and you're yeah. like, look what they're doing. Look mm-hmm. what they're doing. So Desert Storm kicks off. Go over there. Um, come back from that. Pre-Ranger had been shut down, so I said, they said, does anyone want to go to Ranger school without going to Pre-Ranger? I was like, sign this guy up, man. <laughs> no suffering before the suffering? I said, I'm in. Wow. You know, knock out pre-ranger, come back from that, and then, you know, get ready to roll out to SFAS. Now, let me think here, get my years right. I think that was 92. Mm-hmm. The problem was with SFAS back then is once you graduated, there was a year wait. I had a year wait before I left the 82nd, and that was basically a year in purgatory. Whew, man. You know, so here's a prime example. I'm the only guy in my battalion to have the 82nd Jumpmaster pre-test card. Hey, I'm going to Jumpmaster. No, you're not. I love what you're saying about the leadership thing because lessons learned are lessons learned. Whether they're good or bad, you take them, you tuck them away. Those bad lessons learned are the ones that you keep and you say, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. The good ones are the ones you build your toolbox with. So I like what you're saying and how you, how somebody in, in your leadership chain, you know, put that that way to you that like hey there's going to be good or bad you know but take the good put it together the bad just remember it but put it away yeah and uh i like that yeah that's um really interesting um so you ended up in seventh group i've seen a lot of the, some of the posts that you've been putting up recently as as warhogs going along doing their mm-hmm. thing teaching classes the pantio stuff um i see a lot of your your photos that you're putting up of uh jungle training yep. um very interesting i was uh, unfortunately was not able to go to the school you know i was in 20th group for a little while so i did some time in panama and uh, mm-hmm. you know, honduras and bolivia things like that so i've been down there didn't really get to do the jungle training but interesting area of operation how was your time in seventh group did you like it there a I, lot did you like the mission totally I, any, I, any highlights of that there's so many highlights yeah. I, mean, I mean it's like really where do you start mm-hmm. so you think about this the responsibility that you get as a you know young soldier, because I think I was at E5, you know, going from the Q course into group, mm-hmm. you know, and now you're out there is basically, we'll say for lack of better terms, an ambassador of the United States in these foreign countries. Yeah, you know, and then the great thing is things were different. The '90s, I think, was a great. Well, let me rephrase. Early '90s was a great time to grow up in group mm-hmm. because you had a lot of seasoned guys that had seen a lot of things, especially in seventh group. So we didn't have that many Vietnam veterans there, mm-hmm. but you got to think what was happening in the eighties. You know, we had the guys working out Salvador, you know, and that whole piece, Honduras, you know, mm-hmm. Sotacana Air Base. I mean, all that stuff going on. So that experience was there. And those were the team sergeants that were, you know, kind of guiding you along this path, man. And it was just, you know, phenomenal. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between, you know, counter drug, you know, and a fit deal? Really, it's just who's paying the bills. Yeah. So you're still out there there doing the same thing. That's right. Um, You know, and you start learning more about these countries where, hey, for example, Costa Rica, they've got no military. It's a police force. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to train these guys. And, you know, you start to learn and and you've got good leaders that are willing to listen. Hey, man, I know these guys got nothing. You know, PDS went down there. They got diddly. What can we do to help, you know, facilitate them, you know, enhance their training do the best they can because again they're doing their mission set down there so our jobs support us let's support it the best we can yeah did you you notice that at least for me and i kind of i i brought it up a little bit for for me in group i i really liked that part of being when when first got deployed a couple times whether it was to southcom or over to um africa while i was in third group you know it's really amazing that uh, the, the, what, when you have the realization of the influence that you have on on things that are going on, you know, globally, you're over there 
dealing with these these MODs, military uh, Ministry of Defense, the law enforcement. You're working pretty high up in a Ministry of Defense. You have a lot of influence with people uh, to include, you know, everything that's happening within the 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 embassy. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a it, like you said, that, that time period, there was a lot of things going on, but you got to deploy a lot and have a lot of influence with stuff. I really like that part of being in SF, of, of embedding with those soldiers, learning how they live, seeing things from a different perspective. Yep. Um, you know, growing up being there on Bragg mm -hmm. this entire time, you know, you finished, finished out your time in, in service and you got into doing Warhog, and there's um, there are a lot of things going on with you now. One of the things that's been super, super cool, and I, I know the Pantio series, you know, I've seen a lot of the different training videos and things out there. Let's let's get into just the, something recent with Warhog Pantio. How did that happen? And uh, how, how did you get approached for that? And, and how did that all go? Uh, are you happy with the product so far that you've, now that it's out? And, and let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we'll do. So here's here's kind of my gift for you. Yep, awesome. You know, there's your, your very own and it's autographed. Yes, yeah. this is very cool. Uh, you know, thanks for for personalizing yeah. it. It's always no. kind of you know. Uh, thank you also. Like I said, most of the guys that come down here and, and get to be on the podcast with us, I ask them to bring in other things mm -hmm. to put here on the set and toss it in here. Thanks. Thanks. Boom. So we actually uh, got one of your cadre hats. So this is definitely going to go on a nice spot here. Yeah, buddy. On our set, thank you for bringing that. And uh, I know you you personalize this. I'm going to yep. get to watch this. I've yep. seen snippets of it so far. I know you've talked about it on on one of the other podcasts already. Pantio has already released this. Let's talk a little bit about how that happened and what do you think so far about it. So um, really, it was Pat Mack who gave me kind of the intro uh, over to Fernando at Pantio, mm -hmm. and really hit me up. Hey, you want to uh, you want to shoot a video? And I was like, absolutely. So we ended up with the first one that came out, you know, the Make Ready Warhog Tactical Concealed Carry. Mm -hmm. uh, almost three hours of content Ooh, in man. that video there. So, mm -hmm. um, and then we ended up, we just got done doing another one. It's called Practice to Protect. Mm -hmm. So it's using Airsoft as a supplemental tool, you know, for your firearms training. So, um, you know, Panio and Fernando, you know, the guys down there, absolutely very professional on the set mm -hmm. you know you're always learning something i've been on a set before i'm not saying i'm some super movie star guy mm -hmm. <clears throat> but again just you know you watch these guys work the way these guys operate you know it, it's definitely spot on so man there there are some great instructor this is a great instructor series mm -hmm. um you know concealed carry is something that we do here a lot in the united states i think this is going to be a great product for a lot of people you mentioned that you were doing the teaching within the uh within north carolina concealed carry stuff um how, how did that translate into this so really it translated to one of the questions i would ask my students when I was teaching North Carolina can still carry is, are you willing to take another human being's life? Mm -hmm. Because I, I had one lady one time, she's like, how to shoot him in the leg. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, here's the deal. If you're going to carry this firearm, it's not to shoot somebody in the leg. Yeah. You know, you're there to use deadly force when it's warranted by whatever state you're in, the laws that govern it. Mm -hmm. um, so really with what I did with, with this concealed carry video was I took everything, you know, if you want to say flash to bang, Mm -hmm. um, experience from teaching, you know, North Carolina concealed carry. Cause I tell people straight up in the video, one of the questions you need to ask yourself, are you willing to take another human being's life? And if the answer is no, here's the deal. There's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. Just don't carry concealed. Yeah. Because now you're bringing a gun to a fight that you're not going to use. Yeah. And you can, have, right. you can have a potential issue. Students that show up at the range, a lot of times it's great for a student to understand their role and, you know, asking to come out and train. A lot of times when you show up, you should just be there as a sponge, depending on what your, your experience level is. Mm -hmm. There's always something that you can draw out of a great instructor because an instructor can very quickly tell, hey, this guy, I'm going to have to work on this, that, and the other with this particular student and they have the ability to have different experience levels in one class mm -hmm. you know and you can focus you know hey I'm gonna have to take it up a little bit for this guy because he has you know these uh, 
fundamentals are 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 tight. You know, I mean, his trigger, his uh, sight picture, sight sight alignment. These things are all real good with him. His limitation is mobility. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of uh, change up what it is that you're doing with that in that student. But speaking of these tools, um, and we we talked about a little bit. You know, people that come to a class that's excited to come learn they should be pushing themselves. They're there to gain some tools mm -hmm. for their toolbox to make them better. You know, uh, you get there to the class and uh, you know, whether it's, hey, we're gonna do a little dry firing. I'm gonna show you some new text for, techniques for that. Let's put in this this airsoft. And I agree there's, you know, airsoft, I'm the same way. It's kind of like airsoft, ah, you know, I wanna shoot live rounds, mm -hmm. but the, the fundamentals of shooting, there are some I've always said that are non-negotiable. You know, presentation, sight alignment, sight picture, and trigger control yep. are, are, not, oh. are not debatable. Oh, those, they, those are the things that yeah. you absolutely have to do well. Mm -hmm. Stance, grip, you know, all body stuff. That stuff's a little bit subjective mm -hmm. because I can stand on one foot and still have great sight alignment, sight picture, and trigger pull, I'm gonna shoot exactly yep. what I want. So some of those are subjective and the fundamentals, others are concrete. 100%. But and I think that's where the airsoft thing yeah. can really polish those non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. Drawing, pointing, aiming, squeezing, you can't change that. No. And, and like I said, I, I purposely did it prior to shooting that video. I did not shoot a live firearm probably for about two or three weeks. I forget, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere in there. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Out of pure principle. And granted, the one thing you have to remember is that rifle will spoil you because there's no recoil. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You know, and went up there for a shot. Yep. Rocked you a little bit, but then you're right back on there going, you know, I think I did, you know, five and five, you know, five rifle, five pistol just to show, hey, because mm -hmm. I pushed a lot of transition because I think it's a great tool that, you know, whether you're a military law enforcement a lot of times, you know, you don't have access to your real firearms, especially for the military guys. Imagine if they could sit there, hey, here's your target, and I've got however many, you know, airsoft tools for my guys. Mm -hmm. We can sit there, and I don't know if they still got day rooms or I don't know what they've got nowadays, but, you know, we could sit there. I know, granted, our team rooms were a little tight over in 7th. I don't know how yours, yours Ours were. Ours were set up the same way with the, you know, with the scaffolding in there. Yeah, yeah. You know, but we could, hey, set something up upstairs go there's your drive or your you know your airsoft time mm -hmm. and guys can get at it you know? in the in the pantio video do they cover the airsoft your your type of airsoft training or the i'm sorry forgive me what was the gun simulation company that you were talking about guns yeah so it's gun power gun is, power is, is the, that covered is in the here? target not in that one it's in the practice to protect so this one here the concealed carry is all live fire mm -hmm. it is how to actually manipulate your regular firearm mm -hmm. the practice to protect that's when we're all, you know, looking at the benefits of airsoft as a supplemental training tool. And then really, because the only live fire shooting I do in that one is at the, basically, I think it's the last chapter, putting it all together. Mm -hmm. So we go out there and actually shoot live rounds. And I tell them, hey, you know, I've not shot for a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, showing you, hey, here's some, some ways or some things that I've learned when you're looking at airsoft. Not all, you know, two airsoft are the same. Do I do green gas or do I do CO2? Well, it kind of depends on what you have access to. You know, the rifles were kind of stuck with electric show. Hey, the rifles are great because the hardest thing, and, and you can quote me on this one here, it's like getting guys to understand point of aim, point of impact. I mean, how many times did you struggle with your students so they understand, some people call it height, height over bore, you know, whatever you want to call it, but I have to basically superimpose that red dot on the target I'm trying to hit. Mm -hmm. And guys don't, you know, it's a hard thing for people to get. Yeah. But having that airsoft, and I've got to shoot it at close distance. It's not like I've got, you know, I'm not making a 100-yard shot with that thing. So right there in the garage, it's like, hey, you can get guys right there to, you know, understand that point. So now we do go out to go live fire, you know, especially if I was a squad leader and I've got all my training done back at the house. Mm -hmm. Man, think about how good my squad would be. Yeah. Think about how I could go. Hey. Yeah, I think uh, talking about that, I, I personally believe, and I'm, of course I'm biased, you know, I mm -hmm. think that the best trainers out there are actually, and there's this term in the industry, the operator types, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, I personally don't like that very much. I'm very happy with force multiplier, mm -hmm. you know, force, force multiplying is, is a great skill to be able to go out and teach people basics. 
we've all heard that. You know, advanced skills are the basics mastered. Okay. And when you go out and train those fundamentals, you know, to where they're second nature, you really get to that next level. Your proficiency, as much as you shoot mm -hmm. and you do it right, do it correctly, you get into that advanced, advanced area. Um, with a lot of the training that you do with Warhog, uh, there's a couple things, man, we could get off on firearms for a while, both you and I can. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about one of your other skill sets while you were assigned to USASOC. Um, you got into dog handling. How did how did how did the dog handling start and what uh, you know whatever you'll divulge um, what what how did you actually learn that that skill and what did that mean to you being a dog handler? So, I know I know it's a big part of your life. Yeah, so it, 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 let's talk about dog handling a little bit. It's a huge part. So here's the thing. You know, think about it. You know, we were running dogs in the GWAT. Mm -hmm. They were always kind of there. So you you picked up tips as you were kind of going along. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can remember, you know, we were out there um, trying to track down a guy one night and you got the big guy in the sky telling you, he went right. And the dog's going, no, he went left. And sure enough, we go right because that's what we're told to do. Mm -hmm. And what happens, my man from the left boogies out somewhere else. So it's like, that was one of those that, hey man, these guys, even though you've got technology, these guys know what's going on. So Amazing. have a little have a little more faith in, in them. Mm -hmm. um, originally, when they asked me to go to the dogs, I didn't want to go. I said, really, you want me to leave the boys? Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. But again, it was just, it was, you know, my leadership was looking, trying to help me out, you know, career, career progression-wise. I mm -hmm. um, said, all right, you know, I'll take the dog team. Wasn't really what I wanted, but, you know, embraced it. And, you know, you find out what winds up happening is just probably the best thing going. Because I am you know, seasoned guy, I know the playbook, I'm out there on the battlefield, and I'm more or less the independent agent. Yeah. No one's saying, hey, you need to do this. Hey, you know it's what- It's a unique skill set it, for one, sure. 100%, you yeah. know what to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can hear radio calls. I already know three plays ahead what's gonna happen. Yeah. I'm positioning myself, hey, what does this target build look like? Where do I need to be? How's it most advantageous? You know, I can remember guys going, hey man, you ready? You know, making a radio call, hey man, you ready? Mm -hmm. Hey, you ready? And I'm standing right behind him. You know, it's like, yeah, you know what's going to happen. So De definitely a real, an, an interesting part of your history. You know, mm -hmm. doing the handling. Um, the current dog that you have now that has his own Instagram page, mm -hmm. which I find that awesome. Uh, you know, it was that one of your service dogs, yeah. or is it? He's retired. I know he's retired yep. with you now. Yep. Um, but he actually that was one of your dogs. Yeah, he's one of the dogs I deployed with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Funny, I won't say a funny story, but really, um, you know, a story with him, we ended up taking about a 30 foot um, fall out of a helo. And the thing was, let's think about it. Wow. I, I ended up, I, I ended up getting knocked out, mm -hmm. but I jacked my hand all up. And I mean, you know this, I didn't say squat to my medic about being knocked out mm -hmm. because if I'm knocked out, then you're going to go send me somewhere else, you know, to get my head looked at, I'm going to be out of the game, yada, yada. It's like. Just fix my hand. I don't know what's wrong with it. I yeah. think it's broke. Yeah. Just give me some duct tape, Motrin, whatever. Yeah. You know, let's keep this thing going. Uh, but I think, you know, I think that was kind of both of our demises. Uh, I think that was kind of what set me over the edge. I hate to use TBI in a singular because we mm -hmm. get multiple of them. Yeah. But I think that was kind of what started the brain going down the road of being smashed. You know, obviously the hand and stuff being all messed up. Neck back looks like a crooked mm -hmm. politician now. But I think that had an effect on Duco as well. He didn't show it out on target, although I've got severe concussion amnesia. And he took the fall as well. He, yeah. We, we were literally going out together. Mm -hmm. You know, the bird pulls power. You know, I'm guessing about 30 feet from the number of, oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. Going off the high, you know, what's it, the 10-meter board. Seemed yeah. about that, you know, that distance on an uneven, you know, ground. We hit, smash. I don't know how long I was out for. Nods off. You know, next thing I know, I've got you know, a uh, tail rotor somewhere by my head going, hmm. really, I'm going to die this way. It's like, I didn't sign up for this one. Yeah. Um, but I don't remember, I remember going up to the target, but I don't remember actions on, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I don't remember getting back on the aircraft, bunch of things you miss. And, you know, years later, people was like, yeah, it's classic concussion amnesia. Yeah. And it's just one of those that you, he's a good dog. I mean, oh, he's, he's pretty relaxed. You know, I know he, when, he is. when uh, we were down in Meridian, Mississippi at the tactical game, I met the dog the first time down there. He was definitely really, you know, relaxed, easy. You can tell he's retired. 
But, <laughs> but here's the thing. Duco was always that way, right? Yeah. He was always the dog that you kind of get him. He's just sitting there with his paws crossed in the kennel, just chilling. But, man, when it was time to work, that dog would bring it, man. I yeah. mean, yeah. Was there a, one of the things, I'm like I said, we could we can get down some rabbit holes on a couple mm-hmm. things. One of... Um, one of the uh, special special stuff with the dog was there much special equipment? Because since you have I, you have you and I have known each other, you know we've been working with some canine products and mm-hmm. things like that. What kind of special things did you have to have for the dog? And I know that when we met, you were doing some harnesses and leashes and things we're, like that. We're still the warhog. yeah, we're still trying to work. You know our canine product line that we're looking to launch, and it's you know it has the versatility. You know, everyone thinks, hey, you're going to go mill LE. Yeah, that, that's cool, but it'll also have a civilian application as well. Yeah. So it'll, it'll cross the spectrum. Um, but really, it was his assault vest, and then his camera was his main moneymaker. Uh, he'd have an e-collar on, and a lot of people go, oh, that's just a ham room for a correction. Nope. Mm-hmm. That, was, that was a silent recall. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to send him out, you know, to go hunt somebody down, especially at night, the last thing I want to do is be out there hooping and hollering for him. So I could just give him, you know, a couple bumps on his E to either stop him, you know, a single bump, he'd kind of just hold up, kind of look back and check in. Mm-hmm. Or if I gave him multiple bumps on his E, he's going to turn around and come back to the pack and go, all right, Dad, what do you want? Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. Yeah. Love it. Very interesting. Yeah. So let's talk about C2R. So I wind up, you know, talking to Paul, I know, you know, made of mine over the UK. He's mm-hmm. got his own, um, you know, company over there. And somehow we talk about, hey, would you be willing to do a vest in ATAX? He's like, yeah, sure. Well, it's mm-hmm. got to be ATAX Ghost because I'm not. Yeah. I hung up the big green machine. So <laughs> he's like, yeah. yeah, mate, you know, what are you looking for? I'm like, you know, I trust you, Paul. You know, I know mm-hmm. you do great work. Just here's, you know, minimalistic looking vest. Cool. And basically uh-huh. here's what he comes up with. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, you see kind of it's got the Warhog logo on there to start. And I was like, ah, oh, it's pretty cool. You know, it's a patch. Sticks out some, but not overbearing. You know, of course, we got our actual mm-hmm. Warhawk patch down the yep. bottom there. But really, here's here's where Paul kind of shows his money and his craftsmanship and his thought. Um, and we'll get into some of the other details. But when I lift up the mag pouch here, you know, boom. Yeah, love it. You know, personalized logos. Per- personalized. Yeah. You know, did he have to do that? Nope. Did he do it? Yes. So what's that tell me? That's going, hey, man, I'm taking the extra effort. Um, which is which is interesting. Let me jump in on this okay. one. A little caveat on that. You know, C2R, I believe, had done some stuff with ATAX in the past, mm-hmm. very, a little bit. But C2R is not a giant company, mm-hmm. but they're more of an exclusive company. Um, and they don't do the, the, the quantity, but the quality is there. And apparently, you know, like you said, when you reached out to them and asked them to do these, you got back a little bit more than what you asked for. One hundred. You know? yeah. So um, we do look at these. They're very, uh, very modern design. Mm-hmm. You know, they're using some Hypalon and some lamination stuff here. Yep. Minimalistic. Um, you know, com- it looks very, very comfortable. I haven't ran it. Um, the heavy mesh that's in here for moisture wicking, mm-hmm. some uh, some 500D in here. Again, some Hypalon type stuff. Uh, the, the the crotch pouch. Um, I know that the one thing that you were pointing out to me, and, and I've seen that because a lot of the pouches out there are kind of standard. You're going to get when you seat your magazine in them, they're either going to be too low, they're going to be too high. You know, you can't get your hand on it and index it out of the pouch or whatever. And Paul came up with a per- pretty interesting solution for this for this particular plate carrier. Yeah, so he just basically has, you know, Kydex there. Mm-hmm. He's got Velcro on the back. So one side of this got just the the yep. hook the hook side just, of the hook side of the Velcro. Yep. And and then he's got the pile on the inside. So mm-hmm. really, you know, yeah, I'll stick it in there and be fighting it back and forth, but you'll kind of see my my uh, graphic representation. I've got this <laughs> whole space here to play with. So if you want to drop it down a little bit further, exactly. have a little less magazine showing, what? then you can drop it down just a little bit. Or you want to be able to get your hand on it a little bit quicker, yep. you can bring it up you and can say, bring it. get it to the sweet spot. Exactly. Okay. And, and here's the beauty. They're all like that. Mm-hmm. So I can sit there and go, for lack of better terms, if you want to say this is my number one spot, maybe I crank that a little higher because that's where I want to get it, and I could take two and three and dump them a little lower. Yeah, you know? really nice. You know, we were real excited. Uh, like I said, uh, C2R was one of those companies in, in Britain that, that um, 
you know, again, it's an exclusive. It's mm -hmm. not, not a lot of volume stuff, but people know this company. I and mean, again, this is another gentleman that brings a wealth of experience, real world experience into products. Yeah. And we were real excited that he did these with you. And, and uh, I have since, since you have gotten these plate carriers from him, I've seen that he's been, people are requesting plate carriers and stuff from him in ATAX. So I think that, that these coming out is starting to kind of get him a little bit back into ATAX. Sure. We're super glad that you're rocking the things within Warhog mm -hmm. and that you're using some ATAX products. Um, you know, the Ghost LE has been real popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this, uh, you know, is almost outdone. Um, IX is kind of our intermediate pattern, the middle piece, and uh, we put a lot of emphasis on that on tactical nylon, mm -hmm. uh, that particular colorway. But the Ghost, um, man, we just keep getting hit over and over from these uh, local SWAT um, We've had marshals. The marshals are wearing it and stuff. So this this pattern's done real well. Um, you know, the gray is the new black type thing. Black black was the deal for a while, um, but wolf gray just took over the industry, and you know everybody started turning out wolf gray. This pattern's going to work well whether you're wearing gear in it and you're wearing a gray uniform or a ghost uniform and gray gear. And we've seen some of those pictures starting to filter back in from the tactical law enforcement guys, the SRTs and SWAT guys. Really neat pattern, and uh, you know I know I know you've been rocking this for a while with the classes and everything. The other point I wanted to bring up is when you look at these two. Obviously, you can see like on that one there, yeah. it sticks up a little bit, and obviously that's just your fast text. And this is the first time I've seen this since you pointed it yeah. out, which, you know, a lot of people are coming to these switchable shingles mm -hmm. that are on the front. Yep. Pop it off. You can put a different configuration on here. But having these fast texts here, um, a lot of times we hear, you know, whether you're running a primary, secondary firearm, you know, when you shoulder a weapon, a lot of times you get up in this area in here, you don't want bulky stuff in mm -hmm. here, which a lot of people are doing these fast texts right up in this shoulder area. Yep. So I thought that this was definitely a really neat solution yeah, to see, putting those narrow buckles Yeah, in you, you look at it and it's slick, but then really, you know, when you pull it back, you can see the hook right in yeah. there. And I mean, that's just, so now I pop it off. I mean, I've got, I could almost go low vis for lack of better terms, because I've got nothing. Yeah, just just, hey, just a carrier. Hey, what's your moobs doing sticking out there? Oh, yeah. my bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually like that quite a bit. And like I said, until you pointed it out, having two variations of that, um, I, I definitely like that quite yeah. a bit. And like I said, you can actually strip the front shingle off and put something over it, and you almost don't know you your could character run, yeah. running armor. Straight, run your regular armor there. Hmm. So, um, and then this thing I found. So, actually, Chase Tactical gave me this thing out at SHOT Show, just the that hook there, man. So, yeah, it's, a, it's a bomber hook, so now you get done sweating in this thing. Yeah, hook yeah. A, hook I've right definitely the seen right. these things before. Yeah. They are they're bomb proof. So, it's definitely good stuff right there. So, yep. but yeah, um, but belt wise, you know, running, you know, the Templar gear belt, I think that's the one, uh, I got this from you Yep. and you know, it's been, it's been a great belt cause I've got the, you know, yeah, the inner belt, the inner belt there, which works out perfect. Um, Real, it, really funny. Cause I mean, for a long time I was running uh, stuff like high speed gear and I, I love the high speed gear, mostly the slims that have the neoprene and stuff in it. And if you're going to, if you're at the range, you're only going to be a ra at the range for a while during the day and you just want to pop a belt on without having to, you know, spend a little time, you know, kitten and fitting and everything. Yep. I've gotten as I've as I've done some stuff with law enforcement uh, as a reserve deputy and started running a duty belt mm -hmm. where you actually have an inner belt. I didn't use that that much while I was in the military, um, but uh, as I now that these belt systems are coming out, more and more of them have inner belts for the belt loop and then a belt system, mm -hmm. the utility part of the belt where you can pop it on top of it. This Templar's gear is configured like that where you can actually have an inner belt and then the duty portion of the belt. I see this uh, this holster's wrapped in, uh, is in Ghost as yep. well. That's, uh, what are you running exactly there? So it's the uh, standard holster mm -hmm. for the Archon Type B yep. and Burly Man hooked that up. So normally, you know, this holster is, it's got a metal hardware on there. Mm -hmm. So you just run it through your belt. Mm -hmm. 
which is typically what I do. I'll be honest. I put I set this up because I was thinking it was going to rain this weekend. Yeah. So when you're out there with the students, there's nothing worse than, <laughs> hey, your pistol's all tucked under your jacket. You can't get out to it. Yeah. So this makes a, a great option. Now I can just slap it over my rain gear. Mm-hmm. But really, it's just, um, you know, standard holster wrapped in, obviously, a tax ghost. Uh, Burley Man did that. And then we got the Safari Lane um, locking system on there. So now I can swap out holsters however I want if I mm-hmm. need to. So I've got one that's got a light and other stuff that he did for me. So now I can just clip back and forth. So that's why I like running that Safari Land piece on there. And it just makes it quick, easy. Really snap nice. on and off. Boy, as, as these things evolve, this kit evolves and everything. There's so many new products out there. My my thought process is, you know, again, lessons learned, good and bad. You know, you keep the good, discard the bad, but you know what to stay away from. Yeah. These belts, you know, we run them. They got to be comfortable. They got to be functional. Um, I, I love these little, you know, quarter drop um arms on here because yep. I, I really don't like my pistol up too high where yep. I've got to really bring my arm up to index. Um, these are real nice. Um, we've got some other Templars pouches on here and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, great. Uh, we've really got some great companies coming on doing some things. There's still a lot to come. Yep. High Speed Gear is going to come in. They're going to be doing tacos in both Ghost and IX. Mm-hmm. Um, they're also going to be doing the Slim Belt where kind of those things are in production right now. Um, we're also going to be getting some, uh, I think some plate carriers from them as well, but man, we really, really enjoy one having the opportunity to work with companies like C2R Templars gear, a lot of good stuff starting to happen over in, in the European area. We've got some good ones coming out here in the United States and, uh, man, I'll tell you, we again we really appreciate rick you taking the time to come down here and talk to us we love everything that you're doing out there in the industry for people that really are passionate about learning these skills and skill sets um and out representing us and and atax and warhog we really do appreciate it and like i said such great things that we're, we're getting to do with you and the other uh, ATAX Tactical Pro guys. Um, I can't think of, is there anything else, flyers that we, things that we didn't cover, man? There's so much we could probably man, sit here for we, two we hours. Could, yeah, we could be here for a couple of days, Clint, going yeah. back and forth, you know, but really, you know, from my standpoint to you guys, I mean, I appreciate the support, yeah. you know, and that's really for me, you know, we, we actually talked about this. This is something yep. that we could get off on. That's an alibi right there. You, you know, what, we talked about this when you was getting ready to come down here. You know, there's, it's very, very passionate to me, to, to the vet, the veterans community. And, you know, there's guys that, that really take care of you out here. And you've been one of those, those guys with us, with ATAX. Um, you know, it's important that we take care of each other while we're in service. Mm-hmm. But as we grow older and, and our time, the young man's game catches up on us and we're out here and, and we still get to, to uh, influence. We still get to have that experience that we had while we were in service. We're still dealing with people um, that, that want to learn about those things. Um, so it's very important to us here at ATAX to work with veteran owned businesses, but to reciprocate is the best is the best thing that when when somebody you see them taking care of you and we're taking you know in return mm-hmm. we're getting products for you to teach but you're out there supporting ATAX and we really really appreciate that it's a big deal to us yeah no and it, it's a big deal to me because yeah. I, I look at all my industry partners hey man it, this thing's a relationship right it's just not hey I'm um, gimme 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 yeah you know it, it's how do we work together to have a mutual beneficial relationship where, hey, I'm helping you, you're helping me. Great, whatever that looks like, you know, it goes. But there's it's definitely intuitiveness when it comes to that is big, you sure. know. And I always see, I know when we're doing things in a collaboratory way, you know, you're supporting us and that's there and I see it. Um, and like you said, I mean, you're out here, you know, you're running your company, you're doing something that you're passionate and you love doing, you know, so having good partners involved with One, what you're doing 100%. is amazing. And I mean, I know the firearms that you use, the, 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 the equipment that you mm-hmm. have out on the range and just the, the, the number of things that you're doing with Warhog Tactical. I really enjoy seeing that as well. Um, Although I, I loved teaching firearms and, and still would jump at the chance to do that, you know, as I came on as a business developer with ATAX and I spend most of my time doing that, 
to be able to have the contact with guys like you from the community that are doing those things, it's it's really it's it's personal to me. But that's the great thing, Clint, right? I mean, think about how many times do I shoot Clint a note. Hey yeah. man. Oh yeah. You know, and it's is it three weeks later? Oh hey, man. <laughs> you know, and it, part of that is just the you know the brotherhood that we share. Yeah. I mean, yes, you're a third group. and Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it seems strange. You know, when I went through the Q course, I was a Spanish speaker because I was in 20th group. And mm -hmm. when I went back on active duty, I thought for sure I was going to seventh group. But, you know, my SARB majors board had different plans for me, yeah. and I ended up in the herd, you know, acro no, across it, Yatkin Extension. But, you know, as I was always looking across over there to seventh yeah. group. No, I, I mean, it, we bust each other's chops, and that's yeah. the beauty, man. I mean, we can't. It doesn't matter what group you come from. Yeah. Yours is always the best. Yeah. Well, let me rephrase. Mine being seventh. <laughs> yeah. But but whoever is sitting, you know, the conversation you're having yeah. with, if we had somebody from each of the groups here, no, no, first the group, or first, and then you got, of course, the legion, you know. Yeah. Okay, you got to give yourself silly names. That's fine. So yeah, that yeah, already yeah. set you at a lower level. Yeah. But no. At least I didn't say your name wrong. <laughs> It's all good. It's Pentacura, Pentacata, you know. Ah, you he know. Get, he'll get on me. Well, so I'll give you a funny name story, right? <laughs> Do you remember uh, Ranger Roach? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So oh, yeah. He, he ran was, the world the manuals. Did uh, he do manuals? I don't know. He was, I know he was seventh group's. Ranger Roach. Uh, yeah, Command Star Major. Okay, yeah, yeah. So anyway, he was seventh group's Command Star Major, mm -hmm. right? And I was sitting there at lovely staff duty up at group headquarters one day. He walks out. Is it Hog or is it Hog? I was like, it's Hog Star Major. He's like, yeah. People try to call me Roche. It's Roach. And it's like, it was just one of those. Cool, man. It wasn't yeah. French. No. <laughs> no. It's all good, man. Yeah. I used to, I had a, a, a fellow that I was in the Ranger Battalion with. His name was, yeah, it, clearly it was Herbert. Mm -hmm. But apparently it was Bear, And he would really get upset <laughs> when I didn't say Bear. So hey. you got to get them names right. All good. Well, I'll tell you what. Thanks. Um, I mean, we we interact quite a bit, you know, via via text message and, and events that we go to and things yeah. and industry conferences and things like that. We we're real excited to get to, get to have you down here for the podcast for the day. Um, I know you were out training in the sun all weekend, so hey. even though you you took the time to come down here and come sit down with us and chat, uh, unfortunately, um, our our friend Mark Kelly, which you served with in the 82nd yep. for a while, um, he's also he runs a tactical training company. Where we're going to have the um, the benefit of having him down. He's a law enforcement guy, and uh, unfortunately, right now they they're a little busy. So he was able got peeled off, and we were going to have him down today as well. We'll have him down later. Um, another veteran-owned business, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, on the range podcast, you can on listen. the range podcast. You, you, you guys are you, you guys are, are tearing it up. <laughs> he, he's the one man. He's yeah. the, he's the mastermind behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. You know, it's just definitely, it's another platform, especially with everything going on, just to, yeah. to try to get the word out there. And, it's yeah. amazing. You know, I mean, I was even, uh, like I said, uh, just kind of inadvertently, we were talking about Jeff Kirkham from Ready Man. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'd met him at SHOT Show. He's another SF guy. Uh, ran into him at SHOT Show, and we stood there and talked for a little bit. Was doing something the other day with a poster. Found out that he was an owner of American Tomahawk Company. You know, he got me some products down here to talk about on the podcast. Jeff will be down here at some point. Yeah. And uh, we'll do that podcast as well. But it's amazing. Again, third and fourth order effects. You know, you see who he owns that company with and another entrepreneur company. And he owns a company with this guy. And it just kind of keeps going. There's yeah. there's lots of awesome things happening out here and mostly for veterans. And veterans should be supporting the veterans out 100%, here. 100%, man. But thanks, Rick, man. I mean, appreciate your time Thank today. You, and uh Man, I, I'm excited to see what you're going to continue to do on in the future with Warhog. Just so many different things. Excited to see what you guys so, are going to do. All right, man. All right. All right. Talk to you in Thanks, bit, brother. And, uh, we'll see you on the range. All right, buddy.